This is, I hope you're in the right place uh, and not part of the museum director's crowd, but this is the MSU Libraries Trout and Salmon uh, lecture. So I hope you're all in the right place. This lecture series is fairly young, but has had an interesting history and is part of our Bud Lilly Trout and Salmon initiative at MSU Libraries. Um, we've had historian tracing the early days of the very first days of fly fishing uh, in Europe. We've had um, um, Dr. Bob Baby talking about uh, native species cut the west slope cutthroat trout. Tra tra and tonight we have something entirely different for you. So I hope each one of these lectures will bring some new facet to bear on our trout salmon interest here. Okay. Um, we do offer this lecture series free and open to the public due to the generosity of a number of individuals and we thank them. We also want to recognize that Bud Lilly is with us tonight. <laughs> and, and the collection that he advocates so strongly is contrary to the information in your um, program has exceeded 10,000 volumes as of last summer and continues to grow with a number of um, important and impressive manuscript uh, collections as well. So I encourage all of you, of course, to come and visit up the library. Um, this evening's lecture will be followed by a reception and a book signing in the lobby that you came through. And this event, like any good event, every good event, um, involves the hard work of a great many people, and I'd like to briefly most of the larger people. Um, Jane Snow, Robin Francis, Jane Howard, Michael Hodges, Kim Scott, and those of you who go up to special collections may know Kim, and the newest member of our team, Angela Tate. But most especially, I want to thank Paul Schlick. Many of you know Paul as a noted historian and an author, and we are honored that he's taken on another role and serves as our scholar in residence. Um, assisting us up at Montana State University Library with our Yellowstone collection, our Trout Salmonic collection, and in many other yeoman uh, roles. <laughs> so, I am going to invite Paul to the podium to introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you. traces the concurrent development of the craft of fly tying, the science of entomology, and the technology of printing. It's one of the many exciting benefits of having this world-class trout and salmonid collection here at MSU. Um, so for its sort of internal values, it's, it's, a, it's a swell exhibit, but it, but it has bigger messages. And one of them is that trout and trout fishing really are, are part of a much larger world historically. The Trout and Salmonid collection in many ways uh, reflects and informs our understanding of an ever-changing human society and some of its most urgent conversations. It, it really is a, a portrait of human culture if you, if you look at it in, in, its, in its full variety. Another message is that there's really no clear line between fishing, art, and every other kind of art. In the history of American art, for example, the sporting scenes of, of people as diverse as Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate, Winslow Homer, Carl Rumius, uh, and Ogden Pleissner have brilliantly conveyed the many layers of nature's meanings, joys, and beauty. This isn't just about fishing. 
And tonight we celebrate a rarefied part of this artistic tradition, the domain of the literary artists, those multi-talented souls who combine their own words and images to tell a broader and deeper story than either words or images alone could tell. From Bewick to Audubon to Sibley, the literary artists have empowered our celebrations of the wonders of nature. And I suspect there are probably a few fishermen here tonight. And uh, fishermen have a really rich legacy of literary artists. A few examples, Lee Wolf, perhaps the most innovative fly fisher in American history, only drifted into a career in fishing after studying art in Paris in the 1920s. Preston Jennings, the author of our first important American angling entomology in 1935, became a passionate artist, the better to probe the subtle effects of subaquatic light on imitative fly patterns. And more recently, Ernest Schwiebert and Dave Whitlock, two strikingly different literary and artistic voices, did much to define not only the images, but the actual tastes of the modern fly fish. Now, I've chosen, as you've noticed so far, to depart from the time-honored and fundamentally boring approach of just repeating to you what your program has already told you about our speaker tonight. Uh, because I want to emphasize that we're here tonight to meet a rightful heir of this grand tradition of the literary arts. James Prozac has established himself as a writer and artist international stature. When we open one of his books, we embark with him on adventures that clarify and test our vision of wild nature and of the values and aesthetics that we bring to the natural world. That said, we have encouraged James to reign <coughs> beyond the trout in the title of his talk um, and share with you the story of how his original passion for trout has grown into this much broader and more ambitious literary and artistic enterprise. With that, please welcome James Prozac. Uh, so anyway, 
Uh, this is a painting. It's not a trout. Some of you may have recognized this. <laughs> Um, but this is about life size of this painting. Maybe it might be a little, the actual painting might be a little smaller. Um, but it's close to life size. It's a, a swordfish that I saw harpooned off uh, Nova Scotia. I'm doing a project right now where I'm painting about 40 Atlantic fishes. It'll be a book, but unfortunately the book won't be that big. Um, but I'm going to be exhibiting them in a spotlight. Um, I'll be exhibit. can you guys see the image okay? Uh, I'll be exhibiting them in a couple different places over the next two years, the National Academy of Sciences in DC, the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, and uh, the Addison Gallery of American Art, which is in Massachusetts, all East Coast, unfortunately. Maybe we'll try to travel in some other places, but, um, but I'm, the idea is I'm not painting a fish to represent uh, a species in a field guide. I have some issues with the whole idea of species and the species concept, but I'm painting an individual fish that I had a personal experience with. So as I said, this, this particular swordfish, I saw a harpoon um, on George's Bank off Nova Scotia. And it had this particular like X-shaped mark near the gill plate. So I painted that in. And, and I'm, it's very much, these paintings for me are very much about the experience of being there with the fish. So they're, they're experience-driven pictures. And if, if um, I see myself reflected in the fish, I'll paint a little bit of that in there. In this particular fish up close, you can see me leaning over the fish in the eyeball. Um, but it's, it's about the predatory relationship with the fish. And I'm painting it not underwater in its environment, but at the moment that it leaves its element of the water and comes into ours, the air. And anybody who's caught fish before, trout, but especially these large oceanic pelagic fishes, that grow in the oceans, when they first come out of the water, they're pulsing with color and light, and almost like they're lit from some internal source, but they're not only flickering with their own internal light, and marlin fishermen will often talk about them being lit up, but they're, um, they're basically swimming mirrors reflecting the world around them, so they're, everything in, in the environment around them is, is um, you know, reflecting back at you in some abstract form. So for, for an artist, um, I, I really enjoy that, that challenge of trying to capture that, that moment, which is just a moment. You can't really paint a fish. It's, it's a dynamic, constantly changing thing. Any, any painting of a fish is just an interpretation. So these are my interpretations. But I also wanted to paint them life size so people would have some idea of the monumentality of these fish that we were you know, losing especially like the bluefin tuna, it's just an amazing fish. And, and for me, one of the best ways to see these, some of these bigger fish was on harpoon boats, because they actually stalk the fish, and they throw a spear at the fish, and it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. But uh, anyway, um, maybe the clicker doesn't work. Um, this is a sailfish. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll start more with, uh, at the beginning, with my interest in trout, and then I'll try to explain some of this other stuff. This is, this is James probably at, I don't know, 14 years old. Uh, at, I went to a camp in uh, the Tetons called Teton Valley Ranch Camp. And that was, that was one of the, that was my first exposure to the West, my first trip on an airplane. It was a really, really formative experience. Um, and this was an introduced brook trout into some high mountain lake in Wyoming a Connecticut trout that followed me out uh, west. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I was introduced to nature as a child through my father's love of birds. He grew up in Brazil, and uh, when he moved to this country, when he was around 14 years old, he brought that love of birds with him. He and his brother used to catch live birds in traps and keep them in a cage on the veranda of their home. And uh, originally moved to New Rochelle, New York, and then um, uh, went to Fort Schuyler Maritime Academy uh, on the East River and sailed in the Merchant Marine. He, he always told me that I should travel while I'm young because he had an opportunity to travel while he was young. And don't wait till you're retired to travel. But So I sort of took that to heart a little bit. But uh, he, um, he introduced me to um, birds and, and, and eventually we moved to Connecticut 
Um, well, I was born in Connecticut and grew up in the same town where I live now, Easton. I live two houses down from the house where I grew up. And uh, so he'd take me in the walk in the woods looking for birds and identifying birds. And he used to bring home volumes of Audubon's paintings of the birds of North America home from the local library. And I'd sit at the kitchen table and copy them over and over. At that point, I hadn't seen Audubon's original paintings, which were in the elephant folio, were life-size birds um, painted on the biggest pieces of paper he could find. And uh, the, the birds with long necks and stuff pre presented some compositional challenges, so he had to crane their necks around. And some of them are in like, contorted compositions, but they're incredible paintings. And as a kid, um, and I don't think Audubon's given as much credit as he should um, as an artist and not just a painter of birds. But um, uh, as a kid, I would sit at the kitchen table and copy these paintings over and over. And my first paintings were of birds. And then around the age of nine, a friend of mine at school, uh, a real troublemaker named Stephen Bartlett, um, started taking me fishing. And it was, it was a kind of a transitional time in my life because my mother had just left home. And some of the places I walked in the woods with my father and mother were sort of temporarily poisoned. So I was, I think, searching for new medium, mediums to play in. And um, so this new watery uh, medium opened up to me. And uh, we, we fished for a large amount of bass and poached. And there, there's like four drinking water reservoirs in my town in Easton. And there's a lot of open watershed land around the reservoirs, thousands of acres. So it's, it's kind of this mini wilderness area even though it's about 50 miles from New York City. And uh, so we had a lot of fun fishing illegally in these reservoirs. And uh, fishing illegally is always more fun. Uh, but, uh, and he took me, I remember one, uh, it was February and it just snowed. And he took, we walked from his house through the woods to this little stream. We were probably 11 years old at that point. This little stream that came in the north end of the Eastern Reservoir where there's native brook trout, and I caught my first native brook trout. And I couldn't believe the colors on this fish. It was just like a tropical fish living in this small, really dark, steeped, you know, with tannic colored, teak stained kind of creek. And, um, you know, the blue spots with, or red spots with blue halos and orange bellies. You guys know what I'm talking about. And I just completely fell in love with, with this fish and uh, started painting them. And I went to the library looking for a book on trout equivalent to what Audubon had done for birds, assembling them all. And I couldn't, and I couldn't find one, so at 11 years old I thought, well, I'm gonna make the book on the trout of North America. And uh, this was before the internet. It's hard to believe, but... Um, so I, I, <laughs> I guess kids do other things now, <laughs> besides paint trout. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I was writing like handwritten letters at 12, 13 to departments of wildlife around the country in states where I thought there must be trout, Colorado, Wyoming. And what I found was that there were particular people that sometimes studied uh, an individual type of trout for years, um, the humble cutthroat or uh, you know whatever. And, uh, and they were very nice um, sending responses to this kid who was interested in painting them and sometimes photographs, and so I started collecting, assembling a list of all the fish um, that I could find based on the names of the, the trout, and, and I found some old books in secondhand bookstores. Uh, one important book was American Food and Game Fishes by David Starr Jordan and Walt Ever Everman, or Walter Everman, or whatever his name was. Um, <laughs> but Jordan was the first president of Stanford University and a really interesting guy. Um, and I became fascinated with these characters who had discovered and named some of these different trout. Um, and and at, at 16 years old, when I got a driver's license, I started in summers trying to drive around and look for some of these uh, native trout. And there was a particular uh, landlocked Arctic char that lived in some lakes in, in Maine, and that was within driving distance. So my friend and I drove up to the Red River Lakes in northern Maine to try to catch a blueback trout, which is really just a landlocked Arctic char, but um, we just thought it was the holy grail of everything. And so we, uh, it was just like amazing um, the intensity with which 
should I love these fish? Um, amazing to me in retrospect. Um, anyway, so I, I started, you know, assembling a list. And by the time I was a freshman in college, I had about paintings of maybe 70 different types of trout. And I sent out 10 proposals blindly to 10 publishers. It was rejected from nine of them. Um, and found a publisher, um, Alfred Knopf of Division of Random House, to do this book, which I was talking a little bit earlier today. It was kind of miraculous because Random House gets like 50,000 unsolicited manuscripts a year. And, um, and the editor who happened to pick up the book was a, uh, had grown up in eastern Oregon on a mink farm and was a um, fly fisherman. So some, somebody there must have known he liked trout. And, uh, his name is Gary Fiskajan. He's he's also a very um, important fiction editor. He edits Cormac McCarthy and Richard Ford. And I went in to meet with him. He's smoking unfiltered Campbell cigarettes in his office in New York. And um, anyway, the book eventually came out um, my uh, my junior year in college. And at the time, I was studying uh, to become an architect. But um, as my father always said, I need to have some kind of profession because artists starve, and you can't an artist for a living. So, uh, but the book did well enough that I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll keep trying to write books and paint uh, pictures. So that's what I've kind of been doing ever since, and um, doing the same thing I've been doing since I was five years old. Um, and uh, so then I, I wrote some other books. Uh, my second book was called Joe and Me, about my friendship with a a game warden named Joe Haynes who caught me fishing illegally in one of the reservoirs when I was about 14. And Joe became a really important um, outdoor mentor you know, teaching me about hunting and fishing and ice fishing and mushroom hunting. And, and, and then I, um, I did a book about Isaac Walton. I got a travel fellowship uh, at Yale to, for my senior thesis to travel in Isaac Walton's footsteps. And then um, I, I guess on the title of this lecture, uh, it talks about a project I did called Fly Fishing in 41st Parallel, where I traveled the latitude of line of my home around the world looking for native trout, uh, which was the idea of an editor at HarperCollins that I did the complete angler book with, a totally harebrained idea. I, he'd been thinking of sending an author on a trip, you know, cooking on the latitude line or doing something. And so he said, how would you like to fish around a latitude line? I said, oh, that sounds like a fun thing to do. And uh, so I chose a latitude line at my home, 41 degrees north, and I went in a straight line um, east around, um, which happens to be in the middle of native trout territory. Maybe I should show some more slides. <laughs> um, um, Coincidentally, uh, um, my uh, address growing up in southwestern Connecticut is 41 Ketchell Street, the same number as the latitude line. Um, just, you know, if you're into numerology or something. <laughs> it also adds up to five, you know. <laughs> um, this has a pointer, I don't think so. But that, that red line there um, uh, is. Uh, roughly the 41st parallel. I guess I'm on, up here we're probably 48 or 50 40 degrees. 45th, okay, not that high then. Um, so it was a good excuse for me though to continue my trout researches because trout are, trout are only north, uh, native to the northern hemisphere. I mean, trout's kind of an arbitrary term because it, it um, maybe I'll get into that later, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, um, in the middle of my trout researches as a kid, uh, in the late 80s, I guess, they reclassified the trouts based on uh, genetic work. So the, the rainbow trout used to be in the genus Salmo. Not, I'm not really into all these Linnaean hierarchies. You know, the Linnaean system distills everything down to a genus and species like Homo sapien, uh, Salmo truta for the brown trout. But the brown trout, which was thought to have been related to the rainbow trout, was reclassified with the Atlantic salmon, and the rainbow trout was classified with the um, Pacific salmon. And the brook trout, my native trout, was actually most closely related to the Arctic char. So what people used to think were trout, which are just fish with a similar profile, that trouty-looking profile with the squarish dorsal fin and the adipose fin, 
actually aren't that closely related. So in the middle of my um, making this book on trout, the first book of the trout of North America, I kind of came to this conundrum like, well, what do I include? A, a sockeye salmon's actually related to, more closely related to a rainbow trout than it is to a brown trout. But I don't like sockeye salmon because they look ugly, so should I include it? And so it was totally arbitrary, the decisions I made as far as what to include or not include. But I based all the paintings on fish that had been named by reputable biologists. But I also learned very quickly that people couldn't agree on how many trout there were. Or, you know, take two species like the rainbow trout and the cutthroat trout. Technically, um, species aren't supposed to breed in the wild and create fertile offspring, yet there are places where rainbow trout and cutthroat trout um, ranges overlap um, na to native places um, naturally and create fertile hybrids. So the whole species thing sort of started to lose a little um, uh, steam with me. And things began to get a little fuzzier at the edges, but still I had to, you know, have these fish in a book, enough to make a book. But I realized that I could, I could have painted 300 trout for this book, and they would all be pretty different. Um, but I just did 70 because I, you know, had a, a deadline. Uh, but anyway, so uh, trout. I think the southernmost native salmonid fish is in uh, Taiwan. It's a, it's a Pacific landlocked Pacific salmon. That's around 28 degrees north, close to the Mexican native trout. But, but anyway, the northern hemisphere is pretty much it. But for um, one of the fish uh, that I wanted to paint in this book on the trout of Europe and Asia and North Africa is, has a huge native range. It's native from Iceland all the way to the Pamir Mountains in Kyrgyzstan and Afghanistan, from Arctic Russia to North Africa in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. And that's the brown trout, which is a pretty awful name for a beautiful fish. But, um, Anyway, I, in, in the course of doing the research for this book, I realized that, that pinning all the diversity of the fish that I saw on, into one, or fitting it all into one species name uh, for this really rich, beautiful fish that lived in this vast native range. In streams, I saw fish in streams in Sardinia, and, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, in this island where there were brown trout living and, and feeding in 83 degree water that had adapted to these desert streams. And then, uh, you know, these other trout in the Balkans that only lived in the first 300 yards of a spring-fed creek because they'd adapted to that particular part of the stream. And they had a, you know, specialized mouth shape for feeding on the bottom, these soft mouth trout. I just felt like it was an injustice to, to lump all this stuff into one species name. Because if someone came in from the outside and said, oh, that's just a brown trout, you could dismiss the whole, the whole ball of wax. So I, I became very suspicious of um, classification and taxonomy. Um, anyway, more pictures. Uh, I, uh, my primary travel companion uh, on the, my travels in the 41st parallel was a guy named Johannes Schuffman, who's actually a baker by profession who lives in southern Austria. But he's the most knowledgeable person in the world on native brown trout. He's seen more native brown trout in their native habitat than anybody in the world. I'm pretty, pretty sure of that from you know, Spain to Kyrgyzstan, Norway, Morocco. Um, and he's provided tissue samples to, um, this, in particular, this guy, Louis Bernache, a, a biologist at Lavalle University in Quebec, who's doing, trying to create a genetic map of, of all the trout, um, the brown trout. But I had written uh, Robert Benke, who a former uh, a speaker here at this lecture series, some of you know Bob. Um, he was, he's kind of the mothership of trout research people, um, the granddaddy of trout biology. And I'd written him when I was uh, in college to ask if he knew anybody um, who caught trout in the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates, because I wanted to go uh, look for trout um, in Europe and Asia. And I was applying for a travel fellowship before I got the, the little grant to go in the footsteps of Isaac Walton. I first applied to go look for trout in the uh, headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates because I had read in Milton's Paradise Lost that the tigress bubbles forth near the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden. And I thought, well, I'll go look for trout in Eden, in Paradise. And, and the trout, of course, survived the flood because God must have favored the fish because he chose a fate for land animals that wouldn't kill the fish. Because I don't think Noah had fish tanks on the ark. And 
So it was kind of a boondoggle idea, and they didn't approve it. But I, uh, Benke said he knows he knew of one person who fished for trout and, or had had caught native trout in the headwaters of the Euphrates. And it was this guy, this businessman named Johannes Schuffman, and he'd never met him or anything. So I, I went, I was um, in Europe, and I took a 17-hour train ride to southern Austria to the little village where this guy lived, and um, and met him. And he said, and he put me up in his house, which I, that's when I realized he was a baker because he lived on the second floor above a bakery, um, several generations baker in this little Austrian town. And the next day, he took me, uh, he and myself and his wife, <coughs> drove over the mountain divide from southern Austria into uh, Slovenia. And we pulled up by the banks of this beautiful stream called the Socha. Some of you may have been there. It's an emerald-colored river. And we parked next to this big sign of a, there was a fish with an X over it, the universal sign for no fishing. So that means, of course, there's good fishing there. So I started stringing out my fly rod. And Johannes said, no, you know, leave your fly rod. And he proceeded to put on a full body wetsuit and jump in the river with his little handmade net. So he made this net that tapers down to a point. And so when he gets a fish to swim into the net, thinking maybe it's cover or something, uh, it just it gets its head stuck in the net and it can't turn around and come out. So he's, he's not an angler, but he is obsessed with, um, in the sense that he uses a rod that bends in an angle. But uh, he um, he uh, he loves trout. More pictures. So some people ask, how did I find trout in Europe and Asia? And I said, I just looked for the signs. <laughs> so this is this is if you can't read Armenian, that says Ishan, which in Armenia they call the trout the prince fish. And this is on the border of Slovenia and Austria. Is a trout and it says fly club. So that's easy. That one says truchas. I speak a little tr trout, Spanish trout, so <laughs> that's that's easy. This one says pastrofa. That's in Croatia, and I can't read Japanese, but I know that's a trout, so I know there must be a trout somewhere around there. So I figured out that if I learned the word for trout in in Turkish, it's alabolik, in um, German it's fohelen, in Russian farel, in, you know, in Kurdish it's guzelech. If you learn the trout word for trout and word for beer, you're pretty good to go. <laughs> um, and this is a beautiful headwater stream in the uh, top of the Tigris River. So I did make it there with Johannes. This is part of the 41st parallel travels. And we caught some trout uh, there. We, we actually drove from Austria um, to northern Italy, took a ferry to Greece, drove through Greece um, into Turkey, all the way to the Iraqi border and then back up through Macedonia, Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia in the late 90s. And there was still fighting going on in the Balkans, so it's a little dicey. But some of that stuff in my book. But, so this, this is a trout from the headwaters of the Tigris River, which we didn't get on that trip because we couldn't get into the tributaries we wanted to because there, were, there was active fighting between the Kurdish people and the Turkish military, and they wouldn't let us go to certain places. And it just became so impossible to go anywhere because of all these military checkpoints that um, we gave up. But um, Johannes went back a couple years later and caught a few specimens. And these are probably the first color photographs of, of tigris trout. It's kind of a cool fish to have a big adipose fin. And the tigris, the tigris and the Euphrates were so interesting to Johannes for um, brown trout um, because they're the, they're the only streams in the region that flow to the Persian Gulf, and there were never any trout, I guess that goes to the Indian Ocean or whatever. Um, there were never trout meat anywhere around there. So these fish crossed over from headwaters um, from the Caspian Sea, the Mediterranean, and maybe even the Black Sea drainages, because the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates go almost to the headwaters of, you know, to mountain passes where the headwaters from other, um, other drainages come. So at certain periods, they were able to cross over. So these fish are kind of hybrids between um, brown trout from other drainages. Turkey is really interesting for brown trout, native brown trout evolution, and the Balkans, but Turkey in particular because they have trout going, have been isolated in these four distinct drainages, the, the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, and then the, the Tigris and Euphrates, which go to the Persian Gulf. Uh, this is a native trout to um, 
Armenia. It's called the Ishan prince fish. It has beautiful big black spots. I just, I just really was into the, the physical diversity of the fish. This is one of those soft mouth trout. This one's from the, um, from a river in Croatia. But you can see it has that sort of grayling like mouth, but it's genetically most closely related to brown trout. Um, they call it locally the zlost apostrofa, the evil mouth trout. <laughs> uh, these are some little native trout from Japan and Hokkaido that look very much like, reminded me of my native brook trout at home. That's a camel. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure that's how I got in there. That's a Mongolian rental car. <laughs> this is a very peculiar trout that was discovered by a guy named Igor Cherezhnev in a lake called El Gigitkin Lake in northeastern Russia, Chukotka. And the lake uh, apparently only goes ice free once every six years or something. And they caught these big predatory char in the mouths of these little creeks that were, in, where there was warmer water, they could digest their food more easily. And in the stomachs, they found this very peculiar looking char like fish. So then they dropped the gill nets um, down about 400 feet and they caught these things that were classified as a separate, a new genus of salmon and fish, um, salvo, salvathymus, I think, whatever. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, this is, this, these are just um, different reproductively isolated populations of Arctic char from the same lake in the Trans-Baikal region, uh, in the region of Lake Baikal, not in Lake Baikal, but, but it just fascinated me how you had all this variety, even within, within the same lake, reproductively isolated population that looks so different. And, and I started to wonder, how do you describe all this diversity? The, the simple, you know, Linnaean system, taxonomic system isn't enough. Uh, this is a Mongolian boy with a grayling. This is, a, I thought I'd throw this in since Robert Benke is such an important part of the trout world and was, was so important in my researches. But this is Benke in his former office at Colorado State University, very tidy. And um, I started sending him letters when I was probably, you know, 12 or 13 years old, and he responded um, to them. So that was really nice of him to do. And, and uh, without him and, and all his work, I would never have been able to do any of um, the trout work that I did. Because he, and, you know, he just sort of introduced me to people, or at least told me where they were so I could seek them out. I'm very, I can be very persistent. <laughs> but anyway, I, I love that office. And uh, his specimen room was even neater. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, that's just a cut, dead cutthroat trout. You guys have probably seen those before. Uh, Labrador dog. <laughs> And then uh, these are some of the paintings I did, you know, which this is a, called a marble trout that lives in Slovenia. Um, they're just, you know, I, I didn't, never was pretending that these look like the actual fish, but they're just my renditions of the fish. Maybe they resemble something. But uh, looking back on, on it, the first book of trout I did, which was published in 1996, the one on the trout of North America, is largely a work of imagination. Uh, because I, I was painting those things from descriptions in old books. Some of them had been extinct for a long time, and I just had very scant information. I'd only seen like a handful of them myself. Um, so I made a lot of stuff up in that book, but um, it's really just a record of an intense childhood passion. Um, but I, I like that it's, that it's probably more imagination than real. And I, I, I be, I've become interested in a, a particular period of time when this kind of stuff was going on a lot. And in Northern Europe in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, when merchant ships were going abroad and bringing specimens back from different places, um, the, the artists in Northern Europe never saw these things in life. They were just painting them from flaccid, you know, skins and pelts and stuff. And, um, and uh, I'll show some images of these things. But like when Durer, Albert Durer drew the first rhinoceros. He hadn't even seen one. It was just from descriptions of a rhinoceros that was headed to Lisbon and sank with the ship. And but the but the, the drawing is so fantastic and fantastical that it didn't really matter to me anymore about accuracy. It, it was more about 
just kind of thinking about our relationship to fishes and whatever, I, I don't really think accuracy is possible. It's, you can reach some level of accuracy, but after that, anything we try to do is just kind of an illusion in my mind. But this is a, a native char in Japan. They call them Miyabe Wana. Miyabe Iwana, I think. Um, and I started thinking about um, the history of depicting stuff in nature by humans. Why do we do it? Why, why draw something that we see? What's the point? And um, when I would draw a trout as a kid, when I was like intensely into fly fishing, I could, when, if I drew a brook trout, the entire experience of being on the stream and catching that fish flooded back into my head. It was such a weird experience. And whenever I've been out in the field and drawn a, like a flower or a landscape, actually sitting there, I remember that hour or however long I was there so so intimately, so much different than just snapping a photograph and moving on. And whenever I look at photos from a trip, they just completely pale. Um, they might bring back, help bring back some memories of the experience, but they're just, to me, just really pale representations of, of a rich life um, experience. But I think my personal opinion about th these are cave paintings in Lascaux, France, or or Chauvet, or one of those caves. Um, why these people did this 30,000 years ago, I think that um, drawing the, the things that you were pursuing was a big part of becoming a successful predator because by drawing something, you really have to learn the anatomy, the articulation of the muscles, whatever. And, and so they would be able to internalize being there in the field, looking at the thing. And, and I think it helped, drawing helped them become more efficient predators. Um, and, and with with having to predate, to kill things in order to survive, I think we also, you know, I don't think humans ever enjoyed killing things. Some, you know, psychopaths might. But um, outside of that, I think there was always some level of re regret having to kill things, and that, that faith arose out of this regret from having to kill things, prayer, or whatever. Um, so I think everything really comes out of the, the predatory process. But I, I think that, you know, we, we fly fish, we draw, we do everything because we kill things <laughs> um, as humans. This is just a picture of, you know, Dutch shipbuilding, Holland, Amsterdam, um, 18th century maybe. But, but it was because of the technology to go abroad that, that um, all this stuff, all this the diversity of the tropics was so much greater than what anybody had seen in Europe. And, you know, before people started going abroad, people only needed to know the names of, you know, a handful of things in their local area that were important to them. But once all this stuff started flooding in from the tropics, they needed some system to organize it all. And that's when Carl Linnaeus stepped up in 1735 and, um, and created this hierarchical system of classification. Not all of the upper ranks of the hierarchy were in place during his lifetime, but the, you know, the kingdom, class, phylum, all that thing down the genus and species, um, which um, I've become very interested in critiquing, and I think that at some point we'll lose at least the upper ranks of the hierarchy. It just, it's just an oversimplification of nature. But it was necessary at the time. This is Durer's drawing of a rhinoceros that I described before. And he'd never seen one before, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, I love these these drawings that are just like what the heck is that? It looks like um, flying buttresses coming off the side of it. It's architecturally interesting, maybe even more interesting than a real rhino. I mean, I think the human imagination is just incredible. The first skins of birds of paradise to come back from New Guinea. Um, didn't have feet on them because probably because the locals skinned them and took the feet off and put in headdresses. So the Northern Europeans um, imagined the birds of paradise didn't have feet and never landed. That's why they called them birds of paradise. And that they they just like pooped out an egg and the the male and female juggle it like a hot potato until it hatched. And then these have feet because this was a later drawing. But there's drawings of I should try to find one of the the male and female juggling the egg back and forth, but when Linnaeus came around to naming the, um, the bird of paradise, he named it Apoda, without feet. And then there were instances, I, I'm interested in the history of natural history painting and how we've drawn nature. Um, there was a great show at the Yale Center for British Art of um, drawings of 
of seaweed done by Indian artists, anonymous Indian artists that were either commissioned by British imperial people, uh, colonials, or they were doing it as forced labor. Um, but these Indian artists have been trained in the Southeast Asian miniature tradition. Some of these you know, paintings are so meticulous they had to use single hair brushes to, to paint them. But given this task of painting something like seaweed, which you know you take out of the water, it's like wet hair. It's not. What do you do with seaweed? But they, because geometry was so much a part of the paintings, they they compose them in such interesting ways. This is just a strand of seaweed. That when these paintings came back to, to Britain, they influenced the, the history of natural history painting from that time forward. But the exhibition was called Ocean Flowers. This painting was done by a woman named Maria Sibylla Merriam one of the few women to go on a sort of expedition to um, New World South America in the 17th century. She, she went with her daughter in 1699 from, from Holland to Suriname, which was a former Dutch colony um, uh, up until a few years ago. Now it's independent, north of Brazil. I have pictures of it. I'm going to have to step it up. <laughs> um, anyway, this is the largest moth. Uh, this moth has the largest wingspan in the world, and this this caterpillar happens to be incorrect. They don't know the, the caterpillar of this um, moth, but I would talk more about it, but I'm afraid I should move faster. This is a, what they call the cabinet of, cabinet of curiosity, or wonder wonderkammer. Um, these early collections uh, by merchants of stuff they brought back from the New World and overseas, and they'd assemble them in ways that they just felt like it to impress their friends and stuff. But these collections eventually became our museums of natural history and so forth. This is one of my favorite dioramas in the um, uh, Museum of Natural History. That background is painted by a guy named James Perry Wilson. Incredible paintings. And um, so in, in my interest in naming and ordering nature, I've begun to critique the institution that does that, which is the Natural History Museum. Um, and um, so I started doing, when I finished the second book of Trout, Trout of the World, um, with all these thoughts in my head about how, um, you know, species and, and naming and ordering nature, I, I wanted to say a little bit more about um, what I was thinking and about our relationship to nature. So I started doing these stupid hybrid creatures um, that were creatures that became their names in protest of being named. So there's a reef fish called a parrotfish that has a, a mouth that's you know hard, crunch, crunching coral. Many of you have seen parrotfish. So whoever saw that is called a parrotfish because the mouth looked like a parrot beak. So I painted a literal parrotfish that, as I said, had become its name because it didn't want to be controlled by language. This is a turtle dove. <laughs> And these are, these are just the tools of the collector, the, the pencil. And, and the history of the expedition was, this is a duck trout. I don't think there's anything called a duck trout. <laughs> I just wanted to fuse a wood duck and a brook trout because I like them. Um, this is a sailfish that I, I painted, just a large. Some of them were, have been big. This one's about 10 feet long. Um, and then I started doing these pictures of actual creatures with lines around them. And in traditional natural history painting, you'll have the common scientific name of a creature under it. And that's, to the audience, it's like, OK, that's what it is. It's a Siberian tiger, or it's a this, or it's a that. But I didn't want people to be held back by having to know what it is and just look at the thing and not have to identify it. We're so identification driven. That's why the field guide revolution has been so all consuming. and. I could, I could go on and on, but anyway, I started doing these pictures where um, I drew these curvilinear lines to replace the names, which were my personal expression of the aura of the, the thing or the space that it occupied, or an, an acknowledgement that the space between things is just as important, that we can't see is just as important as the object itself. The ecosystem, you know, for conservationists, you take one thing out of the equation and, and it all falls apart or it has to change. Um, but change is, is totally constant. Um, I also like lines, so drawing lines, so <laughs> I just drew lines around them. And then I did some, uh, this is a mural I did in an exhibition at a place called the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum in, 
in Connecticut. And these, these are um, blown up versions I painted on the walls of, of the end papers of Roger Torrey Peterson's Field Guide to the Birds, um, where there's these silhouettes with numbers and you're supposed to identify the bird and match it up to the name. Um, but I left the names out because I didn't want anybody to be able to identify them. <laughs> And then I did, although I think, you know, of all the work that Peterson did, I think that is the best picture that he ever composed. I mean, I like his drawings of the birds. Um, the birds and the environment is not so much, but that, it's such a gorgeous composition, and it's, that's just a copy of his, you know, end papers blown up. These are some of the flying birds I just painted on the wall. And then I started doing these, what I call tool creatures, this is a cockatoo that has a headdress with a Swiss army knife. And uh, it's sort of a commentary on how in conservation we only tend to want to protect what's useful to us. So these creatures have evolved to be useful uh, to mimic human industry in order to survive. Kind of like in the Flintstones. I think there's like some broom birds and stuff. And this is a drill duck. He <laughs> made some holes in the log there. And then uh, I started making actual environments um, that, uh, you know, because in the Natural History Museum, the specimen is the proof of the existence of the thing. So I started making the real thing so people would say, oh, wow, that's a drill duck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this. Uh, and I've had people actually go up to it and say, is there a bird with a beak like that? And I said, yes. <laughs> That's a flying seahorse, sea pegasus. I think those are real. That's a flying fox. It's a sleeping fox that has wings on it. That's in an exhibition I have up right now at Fairfield University, which is a local university art museum. Um, That's the painting of the flying fox. It's somebody shot it. <laughs> It's a dead flying fox. But, but I, I also became interested in the fact that in order to name something, it's, it is kind of absurd, the whole naming thing, I think. In order to name something, we have to kill it. So there's a, there's a real big element of possession and control in the whole naming process. When you name a pet, you're basically taking possession over it. Um, and more about that later. These are some of the ocean fish um, in painting for this book. This is my closest and nearest and dearest Natural History Museum, the, the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. And I grew up going to this museum, and I loved the Natural History Museum, the dioramas, the birds all stuffed and orderly lined up. That mural up there was painted uh, by a guy, um, I can't remember his name, but it's an incredible mural. It's totally inaccurate now. I'm sure Jack Horner would have a heart attack. With him. <laughs> but, um, but it's a beautiful work of art. It took the guy years. I um, can't remember his name. I'll remember it later. Anyway, um, uh, this is Adam and Eve. Uh, just to illustrate how, how ingrained the naming process is in, um, the hum in human existence and human reality. Adam's, the first task for the first human in the garden is to take possession of everything through naming. And there's a, there's a, a great story by Ursula Le Guin, science fiction writer mostly, uh, called She Unnames Them, where Eve goes through the garden unnaming everything Adam names, and when she's done, she hands her name back to Adam and walks out of the garden. <laughs> so I, I became a, kind of embedded in the Natural History Museum Later, after I graduated, I became a curatorial affiliate. So I started volunteering at the museum. I learned how to skin and prepare birds and things like that. Um, and I, I learned that they actually still go on collecting trips to far off places. So I, I always wanted to do stuff like that. I think if I lived in the 19th century, I would have wanted to be a um, professional collector. I don't really like the killing part that much, but I like just having, like, collecting stuff and looking at it. Um, especially natural stuff. So, so I, I, I learned all these skills, skinning birds and stuff, so I could go on a, um, a collecting trip at the Peabody Museum. So um, after years of um, trying to get on these trips, uh, in, two, in spring of 2010, I went uh, to Suriname, this former Dutch colony north of Brazil, um, 
to watch the naming process firsthand. So the, the, the main objective of the trip is to look for undescribed species and, um, and name them. And we found one new bird species on this trip. But what I learned very quickly is that a collecting trip involves a lot of killing. And so we helicoptered into this remote part of central Suriname, so remote that the mountains don't have names, the rivers don't have names. It's a totally nameless region. And I also learned that if humans haven't been there, there's no names because there's just no, you know, the mice aren't going to name it. So um, they don't even have an official map of Suriname. They're still disputing borders with the other Guyanas and with um, uh, um, Brazil. But this is this area is part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site called the Central Suriname Nature Preserve. But almost nobody's ever been in this region because it's so hard to get to. Suriname is here. Um, north of Brazil. I'd never heard of it. I thought it was in Africa before I went there. And, and then the central Suriname Nature Preserve is in the middle. I think I'm at about 42 minutes of speaking. Should I speak for another five? Or, okay. So this, we helicoptered into this place and saw a lot of cool stuff. This is a little, it's actually a toad that my friend Christoph, the, who led this trip, the Ornithology Collections Manager at the Peabody Museum, said that he calls it a semaphore frog because they live in, a, in these streams that are have such raging torrents and cascades that the frogs can't hear each other calling, so they wave to each other. <laughs> it's like that um, Panamanian golden frog is related to this. It's actually a toad, but you can see some things on YouTube. So we killed some snakes and orchids, <coughs> and at night we collected moths. I got to see that big moth, the, the white witch moth, one of my pet projects is to try to find the, the caterpillar of that moth. The big, big moth, that one's about 10 inches across. Snakes and dead snakes. <laughs> Painting snakes. You know, doing stuff in the work tent. While we, we would collect birds in the morning and then spend five, six hours skinning them and preparing them the rest of the day. And while we were in the work tent one day, Christoph, the guy on the right, I don't know if any, any of you are familiar with the writings of Bert Heinrich. He's a, he's a great um, writer, natural history writer. But Christoph heard this yellow-cheeked toucanet in the trees, so he grabbed his iPod and he has a little speaker. So he played a toucanet call, and this, the poor thing came careening out of the forest and Bert shot it. <laughs> <laughs> but what I also learned is that birds, like fish, the colors in birds fade very quickly too. And Audubon actually described He's, he said in, in his writings that 75% of a bird's colors disappear in the first 18 hours after the thing is dead, even from the feathers, but certainly the tissue around the eye, all those brilliant you know, turquoise colors are gone. The color in the beak fades. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Um, there's a painting I did of the poor thing. More snakes and things, painting. Um, and then I just have a couple more slides that show um, some of the trips I've taken to look for these ocean fish, because I'm painting all these big ocean fish from fish that I actually saw. So harpooning is a really good way to see a fish in the water and then out of the water. And it's, a, it's a really, I, I didn't know people still harpoon fish. I thought that had gone away with the whaling days. But it's, it's such an um, interesting old way of catching a fish. And it's, it's very sustainable, because you only kill the, the big ones and um, or the ones that are mature, you don't catch. There's not much. There's no bycatch like you know long lining. If you're familiar with long line, they put out a, a single line about 30 miles long with a hook every you know couple hundred feet, and it just is an indiscriminate killer of everything. And even if the fish are undersized, they have to throw them back dead. So the, with the tuna fishing, there's a, a little plane spotting the tuna from the air. This is in Cape Cod Bay. And there's a harpooner on a, the pulpit. In New England, they call it a pulpit. This is about a 40-foot platform off the bow of a 42-foot boat. And then he throws the thing at the tuna. And then um, the tuna dies. But when they're in the, first brought out of the water, they're just like so incredible. The, the colors and the, the light pulsing on them. Just this, you can't capture it. it I mean, a photograph can't, a painting really can't. But you can try. <laughs> so you can see the people reflected in the tuna. That's a painting of a, a tuna I did years ago. 
that's just for scale. Uh, that's a harpoon boat in Nova Scotia um, for swordfish. There's a swordfish that was harpooned. You can see the dorsal fin of the swordfish over his left shoulder. And um, that's a swordfish. Anyway, I, I would talk more about it, but um, you know, I've, no, I've never really seen a drawing of a swordfish where that that big eye is depicted, you know, accurately. So many pictures of swordfish are um, corrupted by people's other images of like marlin or other billfish, but a swordfish is a totally different beast. It's very strange. I was so obsessed with looking at the eye that the one of the fishermen cut the eyeball, one of the eyeballs out, and I held it in my hand, and it was like a softball. They're just huge in my foot. That's in my studio. Um, this is, oh, I forgot about these. This is in Cape Verde Islands this summer. I went to see a big blue marlin in there. I'm painting it in the studio. And here's a, the last couple of pictures. And with the cod. I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
and, and photographs aren't very reliable all the time because they inevitably distort stuff. So the measurements and the photos don't match up. So in the end, it's just some conglomerate of stuff. And it's, it, it might be sort of accurate, but who knows? I mean, <laughs> it's as accurate as I can make it. But accuracy was one of my objectives, but not certainly not the only objective. It was more just capturing some essence of that experience of seeing that fish. You know. For the, the cod, I went out on a, a party boat. You know, in New England, we have these. You can go out on a boat with like 40 people and pay 50 bucks, and you fish all night for cod. And it, that was fun. But, What's your painting be? Uh, these are watercolors mostly. I, I've been staining the paper with tea, so that's why the paper is that color. And uh, a lot of wash, and I've been mixing mica, powdered mica, with the pigments to, um, to give it a glistening color. You can't really see that from the pictures, but um, and other plastic based mediums like water soluble urethane and water soluble wax. So I've been experimenting with different stuff, but they're, they're water-soluble paints, um, but mostly watercolors. Um, I do paint oils, but not as much. Uh, seagulls. Were you going to call people? <laughs> oh, no, oh yeah. <laughs> the, the seagulls, um, particularly in the Pacific Ocean, they have this kind of So the local seagulls in Montana <laughs> swoop down to, oh, in the east, east too? You mean they, you watch them swoop down in the water from above? Um, I, I love both and I see a lot of beautiful parallels between the two. I mean, anyone who's ever seen a flying fish launch off a wave and glide like 300 feet, it's just incredible. Um, and I've seen Fish and birds work together to herd, you know, bait fish. A lot of us have seen that, but I was in um, the Amazon and there's these crazy peacock bass, and they were herding the bait up against the bank, and they themselves were flopping on the shore, but the bait was flopping all over the, the land, and the, and the wading birds were down there, you know, working with the peacock bass, it looked like, to, to corral these bait. Um, but I'm very interested in the, the transition zone between the two and what water does, uh, the surface of the water does between air and uh, the, you know, the stuff beneath the surface. Um, water abs you know, reflects our world back to us, but it also abstracts our world. It kind of jumbles it up. And I was talking about this earlier today. But, and then also the, the stuff at the bottom of the stream, the rocks, you can see it uh, abstracts what's underneath. So it, it's this really beautiful transitional zone. Um, and a lot of the, the colors of the fish and the patterns on the fish seem to mimic that, um, the things that water do and, and the light does passing through water. Um, so I'm not sure that answers your question, but I do, I like to think about that stuff. Um, um, the general public obviously has a fascination with uh, sharks, shark week, etc. Mm -hmm. I, I, the question is, do I share the fascination with sharks that people who watch Shark Week on Discovery Channel do? <laughs> and I, I, I only painted one shark for this ocean fish book, and that's not because I don't like sharks, but just logistically it was hard to see all these fish. And, and I didn't want to kill a blue shark. Blue sharks are really easy to catch around where I live because nobody eats them, and I didn't want to just kill it and dump it. Um, I guess I could have buried and grow tomato plants over here. <laughs> but, um, but the mako, to me, is an incredible fish. And I, as part of the research for this project, I, I stocked different um, tournament docks this, this summer and the previous summer. There's a white marlin tournament in New Jersey and, and in Cape May and in Maryland. And, um, there's a couple different shark tournaments in Maine and the Cape and Montauk. So I was at one. Uh, and I try ahead of time to, to talk to the tournament organizers to let me go inside the ropes and look at the fish. And, and I, until this summer, I'd never really looked closely at the dentition on a mako shark, but the teeth are just spilling out of the mouth, and it, it 
it's such an amazing bullet-shaped creature. I think it's the most sharky looking shark that I've ever seen. More than a great white or a tiger shark. Or, and actually, some of the fish, when I looked closer at them, like a thresher shark or blue shark, I was actually disappointed when I found out what they actually look like because they're not sharky looking enough. <laughs> and even when the mouth is kind of open, the teeth aren't showing enough, but a mako's just like, it, you can't, it's an incredible fish. And so I saw some smaller ones alive, and, and when they're, you know, in the water, they're like purple, blue, like with some metallic weird color, and some of you may have seen these fish, but, so I do, I do like sharks. I, I don't feel comfortable being in the water with them, <laughs> but um, I know some people who do, and they don't care. But I just I like scuba diving, but I don't like uh, I don't feel as safe in the water as I do above the water. But but anyway, maybe you like sharks. It sounds like maybe. sharks are cool. Uh, Two-part question: Are you going to be fishing this week? Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye